Good evening, everyone. My name is Sri Watson, and I'm a design engineer at Intel Corporation. Uh, first of all, I'm kind of very excited to see a lot of software engineers and uh, industry folks uh, working on really hard and challenging problems on big data using Apache Spark. And we at Intel are trying to evolve, uh, uh, actually leading the evolution in compute, uh, thus helping you folks uh, unlock new possibilities using the data, using a comprehensive stack of uh, solutions specifically targeted for big data and AI. And on that note, uh, I and my colleagues at Intel uh, 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 are going to talk about uh, the, the, the work that we have done on accelerating Spark ML workload on our pilot Intel Xeon Plus integrated FPGA platform. So first of all, like uh, uh, for most of you who sat in the previous session, you might know what an FPGA is, but uh, I would like to go in depth on uh, uh, what exactly is there in the device architecture that kind of supports this hardware flexibility. And then we're going to look at uh, the Intel Accelerator portfolios, and of which FPGA is a part of. And uh, then we're going to look at, like, okay, you have an FPGA, and how does your hardware platform look like? And, um, okay, great. Now that you can actually, you know, put an accelerator on the FPGA, what kind of software, software support do you actually need to uh, talk to the accelerator? And then uh, my colleague here, would, uh, Zonge, would talk about how he has enabled uh, the accelerator uh, uh, of the FPGA and upstreamed it to uh, industry uh, level framework like Apache Spark, Yarn, and MLlib. And then he's going to talk about the performance results uh, comparing between the NetLib and uh, Intel optimized uh, implementation of the same. And then we have like a less than a minute video that uh, where we show the benefits of having an FPGA acceleration. So coming back, right, like what is an FPGA? So if you open up an FPGA chip, uh, it'll basically going to look something like this. On the very periphery, you have some basic transceiver blocks. It's basically a way for you to get in and out your data. And, uh, and there's something called the FPGA fabric itself. So if you look at like, what exactly is inside a fabric, we have like, thousands of hardened DSP units. Now you can actually go and configure these DSP units as a floating point unit or a, you know, integer multiplier or uh, multiple accumulate units and so on. Along with this, the fabric also consists of like thousands of these uh, hardened SRAMs. Uh, in the FPGA community, we call it as N20K blocks. And each of these is like around 2.5 KB per SRAM. And this along with the DSP is also like, you know, uh, completely distributed on the fabric. Okay, now that you have a compute and now you have a memory, how are you going to connect it together, right? So that's the missing piece. And the, the, the third important part in an FPGA fabric is uh, the C of programmable logic and routing. So if you're an accelerator developer, what it actually means to you is that the FPGA uh, device itself you know, provides extreme degree of customization. For instance, uh, you have an algorithm and you, know, you kind of realize that you know, 17 bits of position or 20 to 21 bits of position is enough for your algorithm. Uh, with FPGA architecture, we can go and build a custom data path with those positions. Along with that, you know, we can also like, use these basic building blocks to build even more complex structures like Scratchpad and PyFo. So if you're an accelerated designer and uh, you know, with all these things, uh, what it actually means is that uh, FPGA is like well positioned for uh, delivering high performance, and because of these programmable elements, uh, it can also like provide a lot of flexibility. Okay, now that we know what an FPGA is, like uh, let's look at what you know where FPGA is. Uh, you know, FPGA is just a part of a wide gamut of offering that Intel has, right? It's 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 just one part of it. On the extreme end, we have uh, the uh, general purpose Xeon processors. Um, you know, if you're a software developer, you know you just come up with the algorithm program it in your language of choice, compile it, build a binary, and uh, run your application. Now, if you want to you know, use the same binary, you can also like, put it on some Xeon Fi accelerators, and these are binary compatible. So this is what we mean by software flexibility. On top of that, you also have an ability to go and add your FPGA card, and there are two ways in which FPGA can be part of your system, uh, which we'll talk more in depth coming slides, but it's, a, it's called the integrated FPGA and the discrete FPGA. Now, along with this, uh, Intel also offers something like a fixed function accelerator for you know, standard workloads, like well-evolved workloads, uh, like compression cryptography, and these are like highly optimized. And in this work, we're gonna talk about uh, integrated FPGA part. So as I mentioned about like, uh, there are two ways in which your FPGA can be part of your system. The first is the discrete, and the second is the integrated FPGA part itself. Uh, on the discrete, uh, you know, you might have opened a server chassis that are like a bunch of PCIe lanes coming out. You just take one of those uh, discrete accelerators, put it into one of those PCIe cards, and that becomes your discrete uh, platform. The other is the integrated platform. So what we mean by an integrated platform is that you have your uh, general purpose core and your FPGA all in a single package that is socket compatible to your Xeons. 
Um, since the accelerator that you're going to build on your FPGA is sitting very close to your Xeon, which means that it can actually go and access your uh, Xeon's L3 as well as your system memory. And uh, irrespective of if it's a discrete or an integrated, that is some uh, very similar components on your, like what exactly is inside an FPGA itself. Uh, Intel kind of like greatly abstracts the uh, the uh, hardware, uh, uh, the the interfaces basically, which we call a uh, which we call as like hardware frameworks. If you're an accelerator developer, you don't really need to worry about the PCI protocols and these low-level details. So we kind of give you a very like a simple load store kind of an interface. Uh, that is the main difference between uh, the discrete and uh, uh, if, uh, integrated. And Intel provides Intel greatly helps you. To give, uh, simplify this interface for your accelerator. Okay, now that uh, you have an FPGA platform and you can, you know, put an accelerator to it, how do you actually go and uh, make your software talk to it? So for that reason, um, you know, whatever application that you want to accelerate using FPGA accelerator, uh, that is the user application itself, uh, we need to provide some kind of an APIs for you guys to go and accelerate, you know, go and access the FPGA, right? Uh, first and foremost thing is, uh, you need to first determine whether the FPGA is present in your system. So the FPGA runtime system provides you like APIs for you know go and detect whether the FPGA is present or not. Uh, the FPGA runtime is going to basically use these hardware framework or the infrastructure components, which is going to talk to these like physical uh, 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 physical bus right uh, UPR PCI and determine whether the FPGA is there or not. Okay, now that FPGA is present. Uh, since an FPGA is a programmable engine, which means that you can swap and swap out different workloads. So your runtime should also pro give you some kind of an ability to, uh, you know, program your accelerator on the FPGA. And apart from that, you also need some kind of a monitoring, like resource monitoring kind of APIs. So we kind of like club all these APIs along with the infrastructure IP and expose it as an API to the user application. So what it means is that uh, you can build your accelerator. You can, you, you can also write some kind of a kernel kind of a driver. Uh, and Intel provides like a lot of these blocks and kind of uh, speed up your development process. Okay, so what does your single node uh, uh, stack, I mean software stack for a single node with an FPGA look like? Um, since FPGA is a programmable, you know, your uh, user application can be anything. Like, you know, it can be an analytics workload or, or a networking workload, compression workload or whatnot. That application basically talks to some kind of an industry center framework. So in case of Spark, it might be an ML. Uh, Spark ML lib or something. That Spark ML lib basically talks to the accelerator APIs. These accelerator APIs can be, you know, uh, that, that can be, it can be a shim where, you know, you can go and uh, write some kind of complex uh, uh, software where you can manage between CPU and FPGA in the runtime. Uh, but the key point is that uh, if you want uh, an FPGA accelerator, the two key components that you need to load is your FPGA IP itself and your set of software libraries where it, your user application can use to communicate to the accelerator. Um, so now that we have a single node, how do we actually upscale it, right? So for that, I'll uh, let my colleague Zongye to take over. Okay, as my colleague Siri mentioned that uh, to offload a workload onto FPGA, the pre prerequisite is to first flash the FPGA device with the uh, appropriate IP. So for a single node, that is very, uh, it, it is easy to manage. However, for a distributed platform like Spark to leverage uh, FPGA, the challenge is to uh, dynamically flash the uh, pool of F FPGA resources that the F uh, Spark application will run on. So to address this problem, we have enabled FPGA on the resource uh, management layer, which is Yarn. And so uh, Spark will launch the workload to Yarn and will we'll send the FPGA constraints with it. Then Yarn will look at the constraints, uh, schedule a appropriate node based on the requirements, and then place the workload on a certain uh, node manager host. Before launching the container, Yarn will first fetch the IP from a shared storage flash it to the FPG device on that host, and then launch the compute, uh, launch the container on the compute node. So let's look at the work that we have done upstream. First, uh, how to launch the workload and how to place the workload. So first of all, we, uh, we have added two new options to Spark Core to 
let, to give the user an interface to define the uh, FPGA constraints for their uh, application. So we have added FPGA type, which is a string value describing the type of FPGA resource that your application requires, MCP or DCP. And then we have FPGA IP, which is a pair of IP ID and count uh, divided by a colon. And it, 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 you can use this uh, option to uh, tell which kind of IP, how many of which IPs your uh, application uh, requires. And this uh, FPGA IP option is repeatable. So if your application depends on many uh, FPGA IPs, you can uh, describe as much as you want. To have the Spark Application Master understand these new options, we've modified uh, the Application Master so that if there is FPGA constraints in it, it will uh, concat the IP and uh, uh, the IP information and then send it to Yarn as a, a FPGA constraint. Uh, this work was based on Yarn 3926, which is the new resource model for Yarn, and it is expected to merge in, uh, uh, in uh, Hadoop 3.0. And on the Yarn side, what we did is we are working on Yarn 5983, which is implementing a FPGA plugin manager. The FPGA plugin manager is not spe specific to Intel. Uh, it is a plugin architecture, so any vendor can implement their own plugin and use it with Yarn. Uh, so what the FPGA plugin manager does is, is when the node manager comes up, it will uh, first enum enumerate all the FPGA devices on that host and then it will uh, report the FPGA uh, resource status to the resource scheduler. So the scheduler will know how much of, uh, how many FPGA resources are on in each node manager. So if the Spark application master that we just saw a lot, places a workload, then it sends the constraints to the resource scheduler uh, and the scheduler returns a uh, container object. In the container context, uh, we will insert the FPGA constraints as environment variables, and then the container manager will read those uh, constraints, tell the FPGA plugin manager what to do, uh, and so, for instance, what IPs to download, and, uh, um, and to isolate which devices to which container. And after the FPGA device is ready, it will report back to the container manager, and then the container manager will uh, launch the container. So let's look at what happens between the container and FPGA runtime software for the application to offload workloads to the FPGA device. So this is an example software stack of offloading gem to onto FPGA. On the very top, you can see Spark and Hadoop, uh, and the uh, you know, the application implemented using Spark, which is running on Hadoop, and that application will call the shim layer. Uh, the shim layer is basically a layer that load balances work workloads between CPU and FPGA, and in this case, we are using Intel DAL because uh, Intel DAL is optimized for Intel. Uh, Intel FPGA products. And then uh, the Intel DAO will call the uh, GEM Accelerator API, which will eventually offload the GEM operation onto the GEM bitstream, and then retrieve the results all the way up to the uh, application layer. So let's uh, look uh, more deeply into this uh, DAO library. So as I said, the purpose of using DAL is because it can load balance works be between uh, Xeon and FPGA. However, another very important merit of Intel, uh, of Intel DAL is that it is optimized for uh, Intel products. So, in so Intel DAL is basically a collection 
of algorithms that are optimized for Intel uh, archi architecture. So when you uh, do a matrix multiplication, it will, it, it uh, uses the Intel threads building blocks and it uses uh, all of the cores on your Xeon processor. Uh, the, the native implementation of matrix multiplication in Spark is using Netlib, and Netlib does not use enough of the cores to get you maximum performance when doing matrix multiplication. So to compare the performance between uh, Netlib and DAL, we have um, modified the blast gem function inside uh, the inside uh, Spark MLlib. So we instead, uh, we, we have erased the original Netlib implementation and we created the DAL context, in, instantiated the batch, batch processing class for gem, set the input matrices, execute the gem through DAL, and then retrieve the result and set it to the uh, result uh, matrix. So to compare the performance gain that you use just by uh, replacing op uh, OpenBlast with DAL, we did a performance test using uh, Spark Perf, using the block matrix multiplication workload. Uh, we have run this workload on a actual BDX uh, MCP machine. Um, the Spark version we use is uh, 1.6 because Spark Perf uh, supports 1.6. Um, the variants that we use are executor number, uh, partition number, matrix sizes, and block sizes. And we did a comprehensive test of all the combi combinations of these variants. And the results show that just by using DAL, even without FPGA, you can get a 4x performance increase just by changing the library. Uh, this is on the micro a performance layer, which is uh, just on the gem computation uh, level. The end-to-end -end performance gain is 1x. So it's, it, the Intel Dell takes half the time compared to OpenBlast. Um, this is because the uh, matrix multiplication has, you know, the computation, before the computation, there's a uh, schedule delay and, you know, shuffle read and write. So, the, the, so there's kind of an overhead to the uh, computation on, on the end-to-end -end performance results. So on an already optimized, uh, impl uh, optimized environment, how do you gain more performance out of it? To gain more performance out of it, you can, uh, rep uh, you can use the, our, our Intel uh, FPGA products to gain even more uh, performance. As you can see in this demo, uh, for workloads like ALS, if you use FPGA with DAL, you can get 53% more performance gain compared to only using CPU. Uh, if you want to look at our demo, uh, we have a demo desk in the Intel booth uh, 301. If you come to our booth, you can compare results between Netlib and Intel DAL using FPGA, actually. Uh, you can also watch our work upstream, how we uh, added the new options and how we define the resor FPGA resources on Yarn. Okay, so the conclusion is that Intel is leading the compute evolution with innovative products. Intel all, does not only provide hardware, but it also provides uh, software stack solutions optimized for its hardware. And test results show that using Spark ML with Intel, Dell, and MKL shows better performance compared to OpenBlast. Additional performance improvement can be achieved in, on the same software stack by using the Intel Xeon FPGA platform. Thank you. All right, questions? Here we go. So if I have a 30, an array, or an RDD of 32-bit integers in the JVM, how many times does that have to get copied to get it into an FPGA and then back out into another RDD so I can then continue to work on it in distributed fashion? 
how many actual memory copy operations get performed? So the way the, uh, the uh, FP actuator works is it works in a block fashion. So you're basically RED gets copied into system memory. From a system memory, we kind of block it uh, in the FPGA so that the compute pipeline is never stalled. So it, to answer your question, it doesn't really matter. Like, as long as the pipeline is full, like, as long as it's, uh, the data is available in the system memory, the FPGA can you know, keep the pipeline busy without stalling. Uh, it's a slide where you showed the comparison between DAL and uh, OpenBLAS. Uh, that was like a 4x improvement. Yes, 3x. Uh, was it mostly because DAL was using MKL or? Uh, so uh, uh, matrix multiplication depends upon a lot of factors, like uh, your compute, bandwidth, and how you block your matrices. Uh, in case of DAL, uh, it's kind of blocked in a different way, uh, so that it's kind of optimum. So your vector instructions are never stalled, right? You know, you kind of block it in such a way that your uh, Compute is, uh, is is never going bandwidth bound, and that's that's one of the way to uh, that's one of the reasons why M MKL base is much more performant than OpenBLAS. Since we understand the architecture well, we know how to write better codes to get maximum performance from our architectures. But the threading library th that you use was it the same for OpenBLAS as well as for DAL uh, or MKL? No, we just use Intel TBB for so, both. Uh, no, for uh, the, for, the, for the DAL, we just used the uh, Intel TBB, but for the Netlib version, we just uh, took the out of the box ML library. But we that one is slower than the one. <laughs> Sorry. Th that one is slower. Uh, so some so performance the difference. Open, I mean, the 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 Open Blast also is, uh, uses OpenMP to parallelize across all your threads. Yeah, but right? that one is slower than the yeah. th Intel threading library. Yeah, but the other thing is, even with normal MKL uh, library, you should see like much better performance compared to Open Blast. Like even if you remove the TBB thing, just by using normal MKL and then try to run it as is, you should see still see like much better performance improvement in Open Blast. Mm -hmm. And was that mostly a square matrix multiplication or rectangular? Sorry. Was that square matrix multiplication or? Uh, so, so obviously, I mean, like uh, uh, the 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 application that we chose was not a perfectly square; it's kind of skewed on one dimension. It was mostly mostly for ALS, so the common dimension was like around uh, much much like factor of uh, uh, ten times less than your uh, other dimension. Okay. So it was kind of skewed. I understand the ALS. So that was a dense matrix multiplication. Uh, it's kind of dense matrix multiplication. Yes. Any other questions? Back here. So I'm not sure if this was clarified yet, but like that 53% speed up, uh, including the FPGA over the CPU numbers, was it the same CPU and you just added on the FPGA or was That's like the correct. CPU reduced? That's uh, correct. Uh, okay. So we did like two levels of optimization. First is software only optimization. We just removed the open blast and use Intel optimized library. On that, you get like 3x performance. Right. Then on the most optimized implemented on CP, uh, CPU, on top, uh, uh, then you add an FPGA, and in addition to that, you see like 53% boost. I see, okay, yeah. thank you. No so in this experiment, so you just uh, accelerate uh, uh, matrix multiplication uh, in uh, ALS, so if you, uh, implement a, a whole of our machine learning algorithm by using FPGA. So what pa performance improvement uh, can you achieve? So, I mean, if I understand the question correctly, you're asking that we use GEM, and you're saying no, that- No, no, uh, GEM, yeah, GEM's kind of using GEM, but uh, if, you, you, uh, if you implement a, a whole of our algorithm, machine learning algorithm mm -hmm. using uh, uh, FPGA, so what performance improvement do you do It's more you like expect? a design decision, right? Like, you know, yeah. if you take a workload, uh, there's always something called hotspot. And if you accelerate that hotspot, you basically speed up your application. Now, if you uh, uh, if you kind of accelerated 80 percent, now you want to put that remaining 20 percent right on the FPGA. Uh, they like it's more like a design consideration. You know, if you want to go and optimize those 20 percent also, you can go and put. So now, now it's a question of how much resource you have in your FPGA and those kind of stuff. You need to so balance your whole pipeline well. Actually, so in this case, so, uh, how, mu how much uh, uh, gem gems uh, gem uh, gem spent are uh, in AAS? 70%, 80%, so, so ALS, 90%. Uh, ALS scoring is actually GEM. Yeah, GEM. Uh, how much? 90% is it? Uh, 90% uh, how, how much CPU cycle are spent in GEM uh, for ALS in this case? So it's, it's, it's around 70% for ALS. So what? 70%. 70%. 70, 70, 70, 70, okay, yep. thank you very much. 
Any other questions? All right, let's have one more round of applause. Sure. Thank you. Thank you so much.